Last week, we brought you the story of the Dreadnought Scheme that brought tens of thousands of young British men and women to Australia to work on the land. Many others were involved in a similar project called the Big Brother Scheme. And while most came out seeking a better life and greater opportunities, Tim Lee found a blue blood among the Brotherhood. <laughs> For most of the last century, there were at least 12 schemes which helped ship young British migrants to Australia. The most extensive, most successful and most enduring was the Big Brother movement. Officials of the famed Big Brother movement are farewelling boys just prior to their departure for Australia. The organisation selects the most desirable types of youngsters and offers them opportunities to start a new and free life in Australia. The enthusiasm for their great adventure is matched by their appetites. The Big Brother movement was devised in 1925 by the Millions Club, which in later years was renamed the Sydney Club. The club was pro-business and patriotic. Their sort of uh, stated uh, goal was to, was to have a million young people come into Australia to work on, on the land. They were readily perceived as underprivileged youths being rescued from the cold and depressing slums of Britain and giving redemption in this sun-drenched southern dominion. In truth, the picture was far more complex. One came out of the mines in Wales. Um, they were all, we were all much of the same age. Some were fairly well educated. Some weren't. But all of them possessed a sense of adventure and belief that Australia offered them a better life. Most arrivals got a crash course in farming to skill and acclimatise them before they were assigned to their employment. As trainees, they receive no pay, but as soon as they are considered proficient, they are placed in selected positions and receive the ruling award in accordance with the type of farming in which they are engaged. Unlike the earlier Dreadnought scheme, which ran from 1911, the Little Brothers, as the boys were known, had guardians known as Big Brothers. They acted as sponsors and mentors to the new arrivals until the boys reached the legal age of 21. In the local town, they would have the local policeman or butcher or baker or someone would act as a Big Brother that the lads could go to if things didn't work out on the farm. And there were cases where, you know, it was a pretty hard life on the farm in those days, when you think about it. Probably pretty primitive. But some new arrivals, especially city boys in the early years of the scheme, found the isolation and solitude of rural life very oppressive. You couldn't assess how someone would react when they're being interviewed in Britain as to what you're going to do, how do you feel, as to when they were on the back of the boondocks, you know, uh, living at the bottom of the paddock. Uh, so some of the problems did come polite after the lads had been here and gone out to work. During the Depression years, as the dole queues lengthened, all organised migration schemes to Australia were suspended. 2,000 little brothers landed in Victoria many in those early years. Among them was a young man who worked for a branch of my own family on a farm in East Gippsland in eastern Victoria. It's a very sad, tragic story in that uh, in 1930 uh, he'd sent uh, gifts and uh, I presume letters and so on back to the uh, family in England and they'd have to go back uh, steamer by steamer for the Christmas uh, period when they were to be distributed I presume. Regrettably, there are few official details of the destinies of those 2,000 young men. The personal files of the Victorian Little Brothers were lost many years ago. And the name of the young farm worker might also have remained forgotten, except that my aunt could recall a Christian name. As young boys, we'd always hear, heard the story. Only of recent times, we started to make inquiries. As generations go on, we didn't even know the, the unfortunate boy's name. And uh, 
my <clears throat> older sister, who was barely three at the time, I happened to ask her, and she said, oh, yes, his name was Georgie. Local cemetery records threw up the name George Carr, and the Public Record Office of Victoria provided the proof. This is the inquest of George Carr, dated December 1930. George Carr worked for several years as a general farmhand for my great-great-uncle, Harry Lee, who described him as industrious, bright and sober. But George Carr was evidently so troubled and depressed that he took strychnine, and what's revealed here is a grisly tale of a slow and torturous death a long way from home. There is no known photograph of George Carr. The inquest lists no next of kin, nor even his age at the time of death but he does confirm the family story. I found him writhing on the bed in very extreme agony, and it appears that he had taken strychnine. Strychnine is a deadly poison, commonly used in poisoning foxes. I couldn't save him, and in the autopsy, finally, the doctor had said that uh, he'd taken enough strychnine to kill 500 people or an elephant. With the story now known, a plaque is being planned for George Carr's unmarked grave. In the inner Sydney offices of BBM Limited is a priceless repository of records. Those files contain the personal details of most of the 12 and a half thousand little brothers and most of the dreadnought boys, a similar immigration scheme which ran between 1911 and 1939. It brought an estimated seven and a half thousand boys to Australia. A lot of the fellows now are applying for their pensions passports, they've decided they're retired, they're not going back to the UK. All reasons that they need proof of arrival. And often the only proof, because none of us had passports, or very few. We had these documents of identity, where the advent of the people looking for their heritage or their ancestors or whatever it is, is that we have the records on those lads, 12 and a half thousand of them here in this office. A high percentage of little brothers joined the armed forces during the Second World War. About 10% of them were killed. From 1949, new arrivals could opt for careers other than farming. Thousands of little brothers joined the post-war immigration boom. Among them, apprentice motor mechanic Eddie Steele, recruited by a former little brother. He was singing the glories of Australia and so on. And that was it. That planted the seed. And a couple of months later, four of us applied to immigrate. <laughs> For me, well, 1957 was uh, probably the biggest adventure in a capsule that I can remember. You're very impressionable, I think, at that age. And the journey out was six weeks of shared with 34 other fellows, guys, in my same situation. We were all 16, 17, and it was one big adventure. There's been a number of, of uh, uh, success stories among both the Big Brother movement and, and the Dreadnought scheme. Um, the Little Brothers, as they were called, and that's where the Dreadnought Boys have become members of Parliament. They've become quite senior Army and Air Force officers. Uh, they've done all, all sorts of interesting things. Uh, one of them um, may or may not be the rightful heir to the throne of England. The New South Wales Riverina town of Gerildery, made famous by the Kelly Gang, is a world away from Buckingham Palace. He's irreverently crowned King Mick but some genealogists believe that Michael Abney Hastings is the rightful heir to the British throne. And for a avowed royalist sitting at home watching this uh, aghast at that claim, how does that claim have currency? Well, it starts... To be king or queen of England, you have to have two things. You have to have Plantagenet blood. Now, we knew we, knew, we, knew we had that through our bloodline, you know, it is a Plantagenet bloodline. And you also have to be legitimate. Now, they've proved that in about 1442, Edward IV was illegitimate, which means he shouldn't have been there. Now, if he shouldn't have, which means if he shouldn't have been there, neither should have any of the people have followed him, right down to my cousin Betty. 
Perhaps the rightful king should have been Edward's brother, George, Duke of Clarence, Michael Abney Hastings' direct ancestor. At any rate, he's a shire councillor, civic leader and the 14th Earl of Loudoun, and a little brother who sought adventure in Australia. We came out on the fair sky, one of them, and we had a way of a trip. You can just imagine all these young blokes coming out. Michael Abney Hastings worked on a property in northern Victoria, fell in love with the more relaxed Australian lifestyle and was careful not to divulge that he had a title. The boss started putting me in the... In the doing a, bit of, a fair bit of gardening. Now, there's two things in this world I hate, and they're both gardening. And um, so I said to him, listen, listen, boss, if you've got nothing better for me to do than garden, I could have stayed home. We've got friggin' acres of it. Later, he became a stock and station agent, stock inspector, and worked in the rice industry. A widower, he recently remarried. A lot of those, those blokes went on and did very well for themselves. Ended up with properties and if they hadn't come out here, that chance would not have been probably available to them in England. And uh, I think it was a wonderful scheme. God, one or two treated their, 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 their little brothers pretty ordinary, but 90% of them were, were very good. You were, you were almost part of the family. By the 1970s, rising living standards in England meant Australia was no longer so appealing to young British men. Numbers waned, and the Australian government believed the Big Brother scheme was at odds with its push for multiculturalism. The role of the Big Brother movement was basically sponsoring young British lads to come to Australia, which didn't really fit in with a multicultural concept. Although we did offer uh, that we would teach anyone or show them how to do it, to have their own Big Brother movements from any culture or ethnic group, uh, because the concept, I think, is fantastic. It was a rebuff which saw BBM make a stunning decision. In 1983, we sold the farm, basically, that we had at Fairfield. The funds from that sale were invested. And we have some very good directors with very good business acumen. And with the result that we're self-funded, BBM Limited is now primarily a youth support organisation assisting young Australians in a wide range of endeavours, including sporting, artistic and professional. It retains its links with the old country. We've sent nearly 800 young Australians to Britain, on average about 20 to 30 a year. They're testing their mettle out of the small pond in the big one. And it does a lot of good. Hi, I'm Adam Gilchrist, and in 1989, BBM, or the Big Brother Movement as it was formerly known, provided me with a scholarship to go to England and play cricket. Without doubt, that year was the most important year developmentally for me as a cricketer and as a person. Everton, it drives it across goal and into the goal off the post. Socceroos Brett Emerton and Harry Kuehl are two high profile beneficiaries. The Big Brother Scholarship Scheme is what got me to Leeds. Their help gave me the chance to become a professional footballer and for that I'll always be grateful. I urge you to offer Big Brother all your support possible so they can help young Australians better themselves. BBM enjoys the patronage of the Governor-General and boasts hundreds of success stories past and present. The organisation has changed enormously over time but 83 years after its formation it retains one clear core goal to shape the destinies of the young. Sadly, Bill Ayres, one of the dreadnought boys we featured in part one of our series on young British farm labourers, died this week. He was 102. Mm -hmm.